Welcome to Discover College Soccer. I am lucky enough today to be joined by Coach Eddie Horn from William Jewell University in Missouri. Welcome, Coach. Thanks for having me on, Matt. Appreciate it. No, nah, appreciate you being here. Um, you are the men's coach. You guys are Division Two out there in Missouri in the GLVC. Uh, kind of, kind of near where I was coaching way, way back in the day. Uh, we were just talking how the, the boy, the schools have changed over in that conference over the last twenty years. Um, but you know, let let's talk about recruiting for once because you're recruiting against a bunch of <clears throat> a bunch of schools there, especially in Missouri and in that conference. But you know, when when do you start usually hearing from players, and when are you when are you outbound talking to players? What year in high school usually do you start? You know, um, hey, we try to, to really start compiling a short list of sophomores that we can contact on June 15th after their sophomore year, preceding their junior year per the NCAA rules. And then really, um, you know, we really probably focus really hard on the juniors and seniors in high school. And obviously on the men's side, recruiting does happen a little bit later compared to the women's side. So, you know, we're, hey, to be honest, we're still looking to finish out or round out our uh, 22 class. We're still looking for about two guys. And then uh, my assistant was at Dallas Cup last weekend looking for 23s. And you know how it goes. You've been in this game and uh, you, you never stop. You're always looking. It uh, doesn't matter the age, so to speak. When somebody catches your eye, you kind of monitor along and then follow the rules in terms of when you can speak with them, contact them. Yeah. So you, you mentioned Dallas Cup. So what what are the major tournaments and and places you like to always make sure you get to, to, to check out players? Um, let, let me digress a little bit on that. Um, hey, William Jewell, um, I really view us as a bit of a regional team, uh, to be fair. So where we're located, hey, we really look for players in the Kansas City metro area, obviously. And hey, it's a, it's a great pocket of soccer, um, obviously, with the MLS team here, the growth of the game and the facilities of have gone through the roof in, in my time of doing this, uh, which is, is a long time. <laughs> and then, you know, for me and my experience, uh, kind of that three to four hour radius is, is always a good distance um, for, I think, a lot of young people looking to play college soccer. It's far enough away from home that you can be on your own, but yet it's close enough that um, you can go home when you want to, so to speak, you know, with the schedule permitting. So for us, Hey, the Kansas City metro area, obviously St. Louis, uh, big soccer city, um, you know, Wichita, Omaha, Nebraska is three hours from us. Des Moines, Iowa is three hours from us. Um, then you kind of get down into more the southwest Missouri, Oklahoma areas with Oklahoma City and Tulsa. So that's probably like our main footprint. But uh, this year, hey, we do have a, a, a player coming out of uh, Weston FC out of Miami. We've got one coming from Solar out of Dallas. And then I just spoke um, with a guy. And, hey, I'm kind of excited about this relationship. He's a scout for U.S. soccer. And he turned me on to a kid out of Hawaii. Um, you know, that's kind of an area that probably not too many people get to to recruit. But uh, I think, obviously, there's good players there. And, and, hey, with that being said, obviously, there's good players everywhere. You just kind of have to have to search and, and uh you know, find, find the right people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so how many, how many inbound contacts do you think you get in a typical week? You know, I know it ebbs and flows, but, but give me an average. Oh gosh. In a week. Uh, well, let's, let's go with a day first, <laughs> probably uh, 15 or 20. And Hey, those are primarily international players, uh, especially on the men's game. Um, I don't know how it is so much on the women's side, but in the men's game, you know, you're getting, whether it be the recruiting services that those kids sign up for or just players individually reaching out. I'd say it's probably 20 a day. And then obviously, you know, the some of those are, are from players in the area as well, but uh, primarily it's the internationals that are searching for a place. So I, I, I'll get back to internationals in a minute, but, but in yeah. that, if you do get a domestic contact or, or, or someone, a real player, not an agency or something, what, what yeah. do you like to see in that first email contact from a recruit? For me, um, because you do get so many and, and hey, it's hard to search through all of those. Um, I like a personal connection somehow, some way where it's not, it doesn't have the feeling of, um, as, as I like to say, this big fishing trip, right? Where you're just throwing out, a thousand emails and hoping that somebody um, responds and has a true interest in you. So my advice has always been, you know, hey, try to make a personal connection somehow. I don't care if it's um, a sibling uh, had some relationship with William Jewell, uh, uh, one of your club teammates, a high school teammate, 
uh, whether it's someone playing in the conference, but show that you've done your homework and that you really know who you're contacting. Um, I think that's extremely important. A lot of times too, it's an automatic delete for me when I see the opening sentence or two in one font and then the rest of it's in a different font. So like, oh, I don't think you cut and pasted that one. So, uh, you know, just some little things like that. But for me, it's, it's always a personal connection somehow where I feel like that, hey, you have a genuine interest. It's not just, you're just trying to get a spot. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, on the international side of things, you know, I, I've seen a lot of Division Two men's rosters, and you probably have the smallest percentage of international rosters of anyone I've seen. So you're getting a lot of inbound uh, contacts, it sounds like, but but not picking a bunch up. So w what's your viewpoint on your kind of domestic and international makeup of the team? Um. Oh, gosh, man, you really put me on the spot on this one, and I hope this comes across right. Uh, first of all, let me say that I am not anti-international in my previous yeah. position. Um, hey, our first 11 was all international, uh, to be fair, right? It was uh, at a Division I school, and we were all primarily international. And, you know, for me, hey, having done this for a long time, and, and I really enjoy it, and I understand that in this big soccer landscape, William Jewell College is just a speck. But I do feel an obligation to the domestic player. When you think about the, the parents and the players that put so much time into this and the club fees and the travel, everything they do, and hey, maybe I'm, I'm way off on my percentage, but I'm going to say 40% of men's college rosters probably go to international players. And that's, you know, and then, hey, when I, when I do speak to, to people, this is, and again, don't try to take this to the bank and cash it because it's been a couple of years, but just in a general context, there's basically 1,280 uh, college programs in the United States that offer men's soccer. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, so let's just round that up to 1,300. And if everybody's bringing in 10 players in their recruiting class, that's only 13,000 spots. And between the MLS Academy uh, players and the internationals, you might as well cut 50% of those out. And then U.S. soccer uh, estimates that, you know, in any given year, more or less, there's about 150,000 young people playing for, you know, 6,500 spots. And, of course, not everybody wants to play college soccer. I get that. But um, and I just feel an obligation to try to help the domestic player. And, hey, am I ever going to have a player that's going to make it through to the national team? I hope so. But I'm also realistic. And, and maybe that won't happen. But, you know, when our national team struggles to qualify for the cup, if, hey, we're losing to Canada and these teams that I feel like with our geographic population and everything that we have in place that we shouldn't be losing. And I know that's probably being critical of someone that I have no idea what their job entails. I just want to try to do my part. No, I, I think that's great. And, and you know, it, it's also you. You like to you like to see a player play. Right. And it's just a lot harder to, to, to see those international guys besides a, a three minute clip video that uh okay i saw your best 10 things ever uh <laughs> right. you know so no i i totally i 100%. totally get that um yeah. you know we we talked about uh going to tournaments and stuff but what about camps how oh. do camps fit into your recruiting uh module yeah and, and hey to be fair i don't think i really truly answered what like tournaments we go to oh. so yeah let me again backtrack a little bit so um you know, last weekend, my assistant was in Dallas for the Dallas Cup. This weekend, I'm going out to Arizona for the NPL playoffs. Um, obviously, you know, there's a tournament every weekend within three hours of us. So, you know, you try to pick and choose a little bit on that. And typically on those, we'll go if um, a player reaches out and says, hey, I'm going to be in Kansas City playing an XYZ tournament. Here's the schedule. Here's my uniform number. Here's the position I'll be playing. Um, you know, especially if they, they kind of fit our profile of what we're looking for from an academic standpoint, um, positionally, um, and then obviously the level, you know, then, then we definitely try to get out to those tournaments as well. And then what was the second part of the question? Uh, sorry. Camps. How do camps yeah, fit into yeah. everything? Yeah. Um, hey, I think, um, they're, they're important, but, um, to be fair, and, and I'm sure a lot of guys aren't going to like it when I say this, but. Hey, I think they can be a money grab also. Um, but again, I think it's uh, important to attend some of those, especially if you know that uh, as, as, a, as a senior in high school, let's just say, if you've narrowed down your, your 
schools that you're really kind of laser focusing in on. And that coach is going to be at a, at an ID camp, even though there may be 80 players there and five college coaches or whatever the, the, the dynamics of that may be. I do think it can be very beneficial because, Hey, it's up close. It's personal. You really get to um, watch closely as well as, Hey, you can speak to the players as well. And then obviously, you know, at our, hey, we host ID camps where we're looking for players and and we actually do recruit from our ID camps. I think there's some schools that um, maybe aren't super serious about recruiting from it. It's more of a fundraiser, or whatever you want to call it, but uh, uh, we're pretty serious about it. You know, it's, and, hey, you've done this for a long time. It's kind of amazing to me, the, the days of a true teaching camp uh, where you learn those are out the window, you know, no one goes to those anymore. And, and uh, hey, for younger players, I still think that there's some real benefit of going to a, a camp to actually learn from a different coach, right? I think there's a bunch of different ways to play, a bunch of different ways to train. And so I think that uh, uh, that in those developmental years, going to do camps can be very beneficial as well. Do you, do you have a set number of players you try to bring in every year? Or does it kind of change with your graduating classes and, and stuff like that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're typical of a lot of uh, smaller private art liberal colleges in terms of we, we do have a roster size that we have to meet. And so it's, it's really driven by that quite a bit in terms of, as you just mentioned, um, you know, how many players we're losing and how many we need to bring in to meet our roster target. And, you know, I think that is some advice for, for players as you're looking. Um, you know, so many colleges now, especially on the men's side, have reserve teams, and it's important to understand how big the roster is, uh, what are you really recruiting me for? Um, you know, for us, we, we sit at about 30 players, and that's relatively small by, by college soccer standards. It's huge for a high school or a club team, but I think in the landscape that we're in, um, you know, 30's, 30's pretty small. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, from what I'm seeing, that's, a, that's about average, you know, if, whether, if they don't have a JV squad or reserve squad, that's about, yeah. Yeah. Well, when you're when you're looking at players and and you know whether you're out at a tournament or a camp or something, what's kind of your your checklist, your hierarchy of these are the things I want to see in a player, whether that's on the field or off the field? Um, gosh, you know, I think a little bit of it is just uh, by feel. You know, you you go out there, and I try not to have any preconceived ideas, uh, or you know, and, and you just really watch. And then, obviously, hey, someone's technical ability is extremely important athleticism uh, obviously as well but even to just your your well and then hey for me I, I think that there's probably oh gosh there's so many good technical players these days that it's it's really about your IQ soccer IQ or intelligence and, and hey the spots you take up and can you play the right moments those are more the things that I think you can that, that separate some guys um, and then obviously athleticism you know the our league is, is kind of turned into this big, powerful, hyper-athletic. You know, I think that's the shortcut that a lot of coaches take. And, hey, put the ball behind the back four, throw the football behind the back four, let's go press, pick up second balls, and go to goal. And, hey, <laughs> probably to a fault, I'm a little bit idealistic on, in terms of how I think the game should be played. And we want to dominate the game with the ball. So, hey, high technical ability high soccer IQ, um, and then, you know, hey, are you a good person? Basically, I mean, you know, when things don't go your way, are you blaming your teammates? Are you arguing with the referee? Are you respectful to the coach? You know, one of the things that uh, is kind of a mantra within our team that I also look for in, in, in players, <clears throat> are you willing to make the run required of your position constantly without any expectation of getting the ball you know I think we've all been places where you know we're watching a game and a kid will make a couple of runs and he doesn't get the ball or you know he thinks he's Moses part the Red Sea and you know it's like come on you know hey that that's just what's required so that's what you do so that that's kind of what you're looking for and then you know as, as the game has evolved and, and hey I'm still on the journey trying to learn and stay stay current and stay modern I think you're also looking for for the modern player and I for me and we'll just use let's say a right back that's an easy one you know back in the day hey maybe you could defend and kick out a little bit but in the modern game you have to be able to play as a right back you have to be able to play as a right midfielder you have to be able to play as a right winger you have to slide in and play as a right center back at times if the left back goes you have to come in and play as a six almost 
um, to get the ball off and, 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 you know, change the point of attack at times. So you're really looking for that modern player that's well-rounded and, and uh, I think views the game in a modern sense. No, that's, I, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, let's talk about your school a little bit. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, there's probably not a lot of people outside of the greater Kansas City area that might might be familiar with William Jewell. Uh, again, when I was when I was coaching out that way, uh, William Jewell was not part of the the GLVC. It was not a school I was I was familiar with, um, and and I was just in Indiana. So you know, I I clicked around the website. I learned a little bit, but you know, give me some of the the juicy details, the awesome parts about your school that I'm not going to find on a website. Okay. Um, well, jewel has been around for about 175 years, believe it or not. So it's a, a very um, uh, traditional, I guess, uh, you know, uh, school on the Kansas City soccer landscape um, or college landscape as far as that goes. Um, you know, we're a smaller school, private liberal arts. So we're about 850, 900 students. Um, we're located actually just outside of Kansas City in a, a suburb called Liberty, Missouri. And with that said, we're still only 15 minutes from downtown. Liberty is uh, uh, kind of a bedroom community, obviously, to Kansas City, very safe, uh, kind of low key. And, and uh, Jewel sits on the edge of Liberty. So it's uh, kind of has the best of both worlds. You can see uh, the Kansas City skyline from our uh, campus, but you can also see a bunch of cows and pastures uh, when you look the other direction. So it's uh, uniquely positioned. Educationally, hey, it's a it's a great education. We're known as the Critical Thinking College, and that's um, kind of our our trademark. Um, the one couple of things that we really take pride in is say hey, you're guaranteed to graduate in four years here uh, because of our critical thinking classes that line up with every major. Um, now, hey, don't get me wrong. I've had players screw it up uh, by not going to class and failing classes. But if you do what you're supposed to, you can get out of here in four years. Ninety nine percent of the Jewel graduates within the first three months. Um, fully employed or in grad school. So from an educational standpoint, it's really good. And then hey, kind of the one off for you here is a little bit that I, I found interesting. Of course, I'm a little bit older, but uh, um, I don't know. There was a, a, the famous American outlaw, Jesse James. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. Yeah. Well, the James family farm is about 25 minutes from us. And Jesse James's father was actually a Baptist minister that came together with four other Baptist ministers and founded William Jewell College. Huh. And then, yeah, the first bank that Jesse ever robbed was in Liberty, Missouri. So you're talking about taking two different paths. <laughs> he he kind of went a different direction than his dad did. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Well, that, yeah. no, that, that sounds great. So, you know, you mentioned academics. I mean, how specifically do your student athletes balance the, the sport with the academics, what kind of support services does the school offer and, and how does that all work together? Yeah, I, th I think we're probably fairly typical of, of most colleges in terms of, you know, the support, um, you know, and, and we'll dive in specifically with like my team, for example. So on Tuesday, Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m., we have uh, study halls. And um, Jewel, we are a little bit unique, I think, probably in the fact that we have actual professors that man those study halls. It's not a graduate student. It's not upperclassmen, whatever, um, they are actual professors that volunteer their time in the evenings to come in to work with uh, our student athletes. Um, and then within my team, um, I always try to match up uh, freshmen uh, because I do think it's imperative that you get off to a great start your freshman year. We match them up with an upperclassman within our program, preferably of the same major. Um, it doesn't always work out that way, but preferably. And then uh, I require them to do two hours a week with that upperclassmen. And I leave that up to them because, hey, our schedules are different. You know, if you want to do two hours on a Sunday night to get ready for the week, that's up to you. If you want to do an hour on Sunday night, an hour on Thursday night, it's up to you. But you must do the two hours a week. And then we also have, um, we subscribe to a service that provides online tutoring also. So uh, you have to go to our academic enrichment center, get signed up for a specific class tutor that you have, and it's done online. So I think all the pieces are in place. Um, if you want to be successful, um, you know, obviously it, it comes down to you wanting to do the work. You know, our academic standards um, for admittance, um, I don't think it's it's like crazy, but, um, you know, it, it is, hey, you're going to have to have 
a pretty solid GPA. Uh, you know, we've, we've done away with uh, the ACT as a requirement for admittance. So, um, you know, the ACT score isn't near as important as it used to be, but being in division two and, and stacking, excuse me, scholarships, it's important though, that, hey, if you do take the ACT, try to get the highest score you can, because that is money um, on the academic side where we can stack athletic and academic scholarships in. So it was a perfect segue, which was going to be my next question, uh, was around scholarships. You know, you're Division II, so you have some athletic money, and you mentioned stacking, which is great. You know, not every school does that. So how, how, on average, you know, what what does a typical uh, player coming in, what are they looking at? Or, or, you know, are you heavily recruiting, you know, high academic players to help help that kind of thing? Just, just what does the scholarship picture in general look like for you guys? Yeah, um, that, that's a great question, um, because I think it truly is different for everybody, as, as an example. Um, hey, if you're uh, a high need, right, through your FAFSA, hey, I'm, I'm, I can bring guys in basically by the time that, you know, you do the FAFSA and some academic money, as well as um, the athletic money, hey, I can get you here for free, basically, you know, which is, I don't know about your house, Matt, but at my house, free is always a pretty good price, especially when you're talking about college education. Um, That's right. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then on the other end, um, you know, hey, we have great academics. Um, uh, you know, most of those guys um, are probably somewhere in that fifteen to 20,000 range. Uh, kind of depends on their academics and, and those type of things. But, you know, when you compare... Um, the experience, I guess, of getting to play Division Two, and and what I used to refer to as the English Premier League of Division Two, um, you know, getting a private school education, that's you know, all your housing, meals, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's 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 definitely uh, uh, manageable when you compare it to like a state university or whatever, because those schools here in Missouri anyway are probably somewhere in that twenty three, twenty four thousand dollar range, and for us, all in is. Um, just under 30 it's 29,310 yeah. no, all that's, in that's great it's pretty reasonable yeah, yeah yeah so and then obviously any outside scholarships that a young person would get um can be stacked on top yeah. of of what we do internally and then we do offer a bunch of different types of um internal scholarships as well we have a shape your future for BIPOC communities um we have a program here in Missouri that's called A plus. If you do that, it's worth three thousand dollars here. So, you know, I think that uh, there's definitely ways to make it affordable if, if this is truly the place that you want to be. Uh -huh. And then the always the the downfall, right, is take out one of those big student loans <laughs> that I don't recommend. Yeah, right. I just got yeah. those paid off not too long ago. No, um, so I'm still paying my kids is off. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. So you mentioned study hall a couple times a week, but. But you know, let's say it's during season. What does a typical day look like for one of your players from from when they're waking up to when they're going to bed? Uh, that that's great. And, and hey, we'll dive into it during for what a week looks like here. Also, yeah, perfect. Okay, so we'll we'll start with the week. Um, so basically, in the GLBC, we're a Friday Sunday league. So we play every Friday night. The men do at seven thirty. Uh, the women play every afternoon, or, or I'm sorry, we play right after the women uh, on Sunday, and so we kick off at two thirty. So Monday is always our required day off during the season uh, per NCAA rules. Tuesday is what I refer to. Uh, I'm going to soccer nerd out on, on everyone here for a second, but a reentry day, activation day. So our training on Tuesday is really tight. It's boxed in, um, just short, quick movements. Um, you know, I'm sure all the soccer folks get that picture. Wednesday is our hardest training day of the week. It's very expansive. Thursday, um, for us anyway, hey, we start to slow things down a little bit. Typically on a Thursday, we'll scrimmage for about 30 minutes, kind of work on our pressing cues and set pieces, those type of things. Friday, we'll play. Thursday can be a travel day at times, but typically we'll just say Friday we play. Saturday morning, um, we do a recovery session in the morning. We actually have a lady that comes in that uh, does yoga with us as soon as we finish our recovery session that also does it with Sporting's first team. So Again, we're in a good location for some of those uh, type of activities. And then Sunday we play again, and then it just repeats itself. And then, you know, during the week, uh, during the season, we live two days a week, and that's uh, in the mornings, and it's usually at 6.30 a.m. So, you know, the, the glamorous life of a D2 soccer player is typically, let's say, get up at 6 a.m., get to the weight room by 6.30, 
Uh, usually you're out of here by 7.30, 7.45, uh, grab some breakfast, uh, hopefully take a shower. I question that if all my guys do it every day, <laughs> but uh, 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 take a shower, uh, go to class. And then uh, within the Jewel, uh, within Jewel, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we typically, or we do not have classes from 10 to 11. Uh, that's called Jewel time. And that's uh, a time that you can meet with your professor. But during the season, uh, that's when, as a coaching staff, we offer some one-on-one -on -one training. If um, any of our players want to get a little extra work in, whether it be around the goal, goalkeeping, midfielders, functional training, whatever you know the the players want, it's not required. It's strictly voluntary. But uh, a lot of a lot of guys take advantage of that, obviously. So we do that from ten to eleven. Um, hey, you're probably going to either have class right after that, or go eat lunch. You're going to have a class in the afternoon. Uh, we trained every day at three o'clock um, and then, yeah, Tuesday, Thursday, then you're going to study hall on Wednesday. Hey, you should be studying if you're not a little bit. And then, hey, after all that's over with it, you get a little bit of free time and, and then it just repeats itself. So you mentioned uh, potentially traveling Thursday. GLVC is, you know, not totally uh, a massive conference in terms of travel but there's a bit there um you know what is your kind of normal travel radius where's a lot of the schools that you play when it's when you're on the road yeah well um the GOVC we're, we're like on the western edge of the conference <laughs> and so um you know the closest games that we play other than there's one other GOVC school here in Kansas City uh, called Kansas City Rockhurst uh Tony Toko's <clears throat> legendary coach <clears throat> been there forever does a great job so i'll make a plug for tony and rockers <laughs> um but uh and then typically you know it's about a two two and a half hours our closest um a lot of the schools are here in missouri but more in the st louis metro area kind of up north and then uh the conference goes all the way to lewis uh just outside of chicago lewis university and then um, further to the east, it goes to the University of Indianapolis um, is, is the farthest that we would go. And then, you know, you have Illinois Springfield, McKendree. Those are Illinois Springfield's in the middle part of Illinois. And then McKendree's just kind of outside of St. Louis, still on the Illinois side. So that's that's kind of the geographics of it. When we go to Indy or um, Lewis to Chicago, obviously we're leaving the day before um, on a typical Let's go to St. Louis and play. So what those weekends can look like, because we do do the, like I said, the Friday, Sunday. So we may go to St. Louis and play UMSL on a Friday night. And then Sunday afternoon, we'll play uh, Maryville University. So we would typically leave campus at about uh, 10 a.m. for a 7.30 kickoff. Uh, we'll drive, get about halfway, stop, have lunch, drive into St. Louis the rest of the way, get checked into the hotel, have a quick team meeting, um, you know, obviously get the guys some food and then, um, uh, you know, we'll kick off at seven 30. Um, sometimes we shower there. Sometimes the guys will shower at the hotel. Um, uh, when we get back, obviously food, um, lights out about 11, get up Saturday morning, do a recovery session, Saturday, midday, typically, uh, do a study hall Sunday afternoon. We typically will try to find something to do as a team. You know, um, a lot of guys, if, especially if you're not from the this this the Midwest, you know, maybe you've never been to St. Louis before. So we'll go down to the Arch or a yeah. mall, whatever. Find something to do. Uh, a lot of times, too, if there's a Division One game going on, I like to take our guys to Division One. I. I think you should always be a student of the game, so we'll go to the different games. Um, just find something to do. Maybe it's a movie, whatever the case may be. Uh, obviously dinner on uh, Saturday night, have another team meeting on Saturday night. It's more of like a film session preparing for Sunday's match. And then, yeah, Sunday, and then we drive home after the game. Okay. No, that, that, that's awesome. Um, well, let's talk more about the team and the, and the games and stuff that you talked about. So you, you said you, you know, your roster size of 30, you know, if, if, if I'm an incoming freshman, am I, am I uh, fighting for, for some time right away or, or, or not? Um. Uh, you know, okay, another long answer for you. So uh, 22, the 22 class will be my third recruiting class. And so um, when I when I took over, if you were coming in as a freshman, then yeah, you were probably going to start, uh, you know, or you had a really good shot and to get a lot of minutes. Um, you know, as we're rebuilding the team and, and you know, making it reflect more of uh, what I like, 
you know, the hope is, is that as the team matures, it's going to be harder for you to do that. Um, but again, for me, it's always been, hey, let's let's put the best guys out there to give us the best chance to win. It doesn't matter if you're a freshman or a senior, everything in between, you know, and kind of one of the lines I like to use is, you know, who should start? It's not the 10 best players and, and Johnny. Right. And quite honestly, sometimes it's not the 11 best players, but it's the 11 best players that play well together. And so, you know, sometimes you, know, you can get into those situations where, you know, maybe somebody doesn't want to defend like they need to, but they're really good. Maybe uh, they hold the ball too long because they're worried about their statistics. You know, so, you know, it's, it's really about trying to put the team out there that really plays well together in my system, my style of play. Hey, everybody has to defend. We want everybody to to be involved in the build up and getting forward. So, you know, you're really looking for that complete player. Um, this year, we have ten starters back. Obviously, we've been playing freshmen and sophomores, and our record shows that. Um, you know, the the I really thought we would have a better win loss record uh, the the fall of 21. And the one thing that I did not factor in it was my own ignorance and stupidity. But when the NCAA gave everybody the extra year. I was amazed at how many international players ended up staying to start working on their masters. And so the rosters never changed. And so, Hey, for us, and, and maybe I'm making excuses, but you know, we're playing 18, 19, maybe a few 20 year olds against 24, 25 year old men. And we would just get overpowered at times. So again, I think as our team matures, that's the hope that I've done my job correctly, that uh, our win loss record starts to look better. Yeah. And then, you know, for us, it's, it's also, um, it, it's about this whole experience, right? It's not always just about winning and losing. And, and so, hey, I'm, I'm a big uh, uh, community service guy, be a role model. So, you know, one of the things that we're kind of excited about, and we're just kind of getting it going off the ground, but we're probably the first uh, higher education institution, anyway, I know college, university, to partner with the DEA, and uh, we're going in and delivering anti-drug and education education messages in uh, some of the inner city schools. And so we have a great uh, relationship with the DEA um, that's also pulling in like the, the Kansas City Police Department or the Missouri State Highway Patrol, Jackson wow. County, which is the county that uh, Kansas City sits in. The Sheriff's Department is kind of getting involved with us also. Um, really trying to reach out and we use soccer as the vehicle to try to reach young people. So yeah, again, yeah, it's a, it's kind of all encompassing and, um, you know, the, the whole goal is to graduate well-rounded people that, you know, um, we've given them a foundation that for their life's work. And as we like to say that Jewel's not a four-year degree, this is what I say, it's a 40 year degree. So put it to good use. No, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Um, you, you know, I think you've, you talked about your team style play a little bit and, and how you like to, to, to do that. So, you know, can you, can you kind of round that out from where talk about your specific style of coaching and, and, and how that all interacts together? Yeah. Uh, again, if I don't nerd out on you too bad here, I, I, I hope I don't. Um, That's all right. So uh, we're a team that wants to, to dominate the game with the ball. Right. And I'm, and sometimes I'm, maybe too idealistic about that. So our, in our game model, right, 70% um, possession is, is what we strive for. And obviously, any soccer person knows that that's an extremely high number, even the Barcelonas and the Man Cities that I think are well known for ball possession. It's even hard for them to get to that. So it's, a, it's an extremely lofty goal. But again, um, that's how I think the game should be played. I, it, for me personally, I enjoy watching that style of play too. So, um, hey, that's, that's kind of what we do. So in our game model, um, and, and this guides our coaching and, and our playing style, um, one is, is building out to the half line, um, you know, and, and, and doing that and, and be facing forward around the half line. That's like stage one. So like at a halftime talk, as an example, if we're not doing that consistently on probably, especially in the college game, about 90% of our possessions, then obviously, hey, we have to make some adjustments. And you know, for us in our game model, we want to be plus one in the back. So if you're playing one up, hey, we're going to use ideally, right, the four and the five, the two center backs plus the six to, to break the line of pressure. If you're playing with two up, then obviously we're going to play with three in the back and use the six. You know yeah. where I'm going, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the second stage is more what I refer to as the movement in front of the ball. So once we get to the half line, 
Um, for us, it's covering the five vertical channels, trying to get, you know, pin the other team back as far as we can by getting high into their back line and continue to circulate the ball. Obviously, the third stage of our game model is the creative stage, which, hey, that's the business end of all this, right? Trying to score. So that's where, like in training, hey, we work on combination play, third man runs, overlaps, underlaps, slide passes, you know, crosses from the half spaces, all the stuff. And then the fourth stage is uh, what we refer to as light switch defending, a, an immediate reaction, try to press high, get the ball back. As soon as the team plays out of the pressure pocket, then our last stage is dropping into a mid or a low block. And so, hey, all of our training, you know, that it's really kind of centered around the game model. It, it, it drives what we do. And, you know, obviously you're trying to create overloads in the middle of the field so that we can outplay the other team. In the offseason, we really work hard on outplay techniques where, you know, around you, hold the play up. In the offseason, we try to do some functional training in our eight-hour-a-week segment. And then as we currently are, we're in our spring season. So, again, we're just trying to refine our game model, get everybody on the same page. Oh, that makes sense. Um, what about the rest of your soccer staff? How, how big a staff do you have? Um, what are their roles within the team? And, and whether that's during practice, during games, anything? Yeah, so I really, I only have one other assistant. His name is Donovan Castro. And um, he has a really good pedigree in the game, you know, played at a high level. And, um, younger, he's, he's on the journey as well in terms of uh, wanting to do this as a, as a profession. And I'm really blessed to have him. And so hey, as a head coach has done this for a long time, I, I feel an obligation, whether it be Donovan or anyone else that I work with, that it's my job to prepare them to be a head coach. And so, you know, I look at it more that we're like co-coaches because I want them to be involved in everything. Um, and then, you know, when you drill down into that, if, if I think they're weak in an area, they probably don't like it. But if I think you're weak in an area, then you're really going to do a lot of whatever that is because, hey, you know, you, you want as a head coach, your coaching tree to grow and, and you want people that are loyal to you and you want to be loyal to them and, and definitely help them uh, achieve what they want in their professional lives. So, um, hey, Donovan's involved in everything that we do from recruiting to the budget to uh, travel and then in training. Um, because there's two of us, hey, we typically break the team up at times. Um, he'll take a group. I'll take a group. Um, yeah, just pretty much everything. Uh, we do have a part-time goalkeeping coach. That, that's a real weakness within our program that we're really trying to address, um, you know, just to give them the proper attention that, that they really need to continue to develop. Um, and then, you know, typical, I think, you know, hey, our performance folks are good. We've got sports medicine folks that are good, as every other program does. But in terms of the true soccer staff, it's myself, my assistant, and a volunteer goalkeeping coach. Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's still pretty solid. Um, I want to, I want to keep you too long here. Just a couple more questions, but oh, we're, yeah, it's all good. we're, uh, we're sitting here talking in March. Uh, so it's off season. Uh, you mentioned, uh, your, your weather is not like mine today, but, uh, <laughs> what, what does your, what does your typical off season program look like? Yeah. Well, for those that aren't familiar with, um, NCAA athletics, uh, and well, in division two specifically, because I, I do think that division three, uh, the contact hours or whatever is a little bit different, but in division two, um, we go through a segment of our season where we only get eight hours a week with the team, mm -hmm. four hours of that is with the ball, four hours of that is performance. And so, um, in that, in that segment, Hey, it really is about small group training, uh, functional stuff, um, just trying to sharpen everybody back up again. And then we're currently in our spring season where we're allowed 20 hours a week. And that looks more like the fall. So for us, it's again, um, kind of, Hey, we play a lot of different type of rondos because again, Hey, you know, that's how I view the game kind of in our, our teaching and player rotations and, you know, interchanges. Hey, we use typically like a five V three, then we'll go to seven V five, nine V seven. 10 v8 to work on those type of movements um hey i, I do like to um make everything competitive and and you know one day or, or one activity a day we, we try to test and rank you know and we keep a running total so the players know because i do think that's a big frustration um for players with college soccer you know you come in and you're used to being you know 
the star, for lack of a better way to say it, either on your high school or club team, and suddenly you get thrown in this environment, you're not getting to play much. Um, sometimes that's really hard, and, and a lot of players um, can can give up at that point. You know, it's like, oh, hey, this is too much work. I just want to go to school, get my degree, have some fun. You know, I'm not getting to play. And so I think it's important to um, – be able to give the players tangible feedback. You know, so much in our game is not statistically driven, so to speak. Um, although, you know, we do use NSTAT that, that gives great feedback to the players directly, but also within, just so they have a comparison, we do try, try to test and rank um, quite a bit as well. So, and then obviously, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a long haul. And, uh, you know, you try to laugh along the way also, you know, this has to be fun. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, there are days that, uh, you know, to, tonight we're supposed to get snow. So tomorrow we'll probably just divide the guys up and bring them inside and we'll just play futsal and no coaching. And I'm a big believer in that. Um, I think that free play is important in a player's development because I think people like me can take the fun out of the game where we're demanding and, hey, do this, do that. You know, this is the options. And, you know, sometimes I think that you can stifle a player's creativity, player for the game you know, because it's so structured all the time that I don't think that young people free play enough um, like they do in other parts of the world. So, you know, for me, hey, I do like to let the guys just come in and play for fun again. Remember why you're here. Remember why you played this game. It was fun. And so, yeah, I don't know. I hope that answered it. That was a long no, answer. It's all right. No, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> well, hey, I'm a, last question here um, is kind of the catch-all. You know, what 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 didn't we talk about? What else uh, would you like anybody to know? Whether it's about your school, your team, your staff, anything that that we missed? This is this is your 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 chance to to let me know what we didn't talk about. Wow, <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, I guess the the thing to like any any player would be that um, hey, check us out. Right, we may not be a good fit for you, but if it's something you think you'd be interested in. You know, um, hey, we would love to hear from you. We 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 definitely um, look everywhere. You know, so even if it's not maybe in your geographical neighborhood, let's say, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't be interested, uh, especially on the domestic side. Um, hey, I do think that um, our education is great. I think that our culture within the team, our team spends so much time together because we are a smaller institution. That hey, the the friendships that you're going to develop along the way. Um, you know, are, are going to last a lifetime. And, um, hey, we, we pride ourselves in trying to be fair to players. Um, you know, one of the things that we always talk to the freshmen about when they arrive is, you know, the phrase brutal honesty. That, that, that's, that's, a, that's a misnomer, right, I, for me. Hey, honesty is because I care and I love you, right? I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't care about your future and really trying to truly help you. So that's something we talk about that, Hey, you can't be afraid of the truth, right? And we will be honest with you. You know, we'll be direct, but we're also here to, to help you improve in those areas. And one of the things that we really try to do also is, is have the players be able to evaluate where they're at, both on the journey in relation to our team, in relation to the GL, GLBC, because if it's always coach-driven, and I'm telling you what you need to do, you don't always get the same buy-in. Um, you know, if, if you can analyze where you're at, and then together, and I do mean together, then, um, hey, I think we can come up with a plan to help you achieve your goals. And so that's that's kind of at our core. Um, you know, the other thing too, I think is, um, hey, with us anyway, the, the off the field stuff is extremely important. Um, just, uh, let's see, uh, I think it was um, Friday of last week as an example. So we, we talked about humility, right, and, and the importance of that and, and recognizing, and that's the key word in this, recognizing that everything you have is either God-given or someone else has done for you and helped you. So I made all the players take out their cell phone, and, it, you know, right before we started training, I said, I want you to call someone. There's, there's no texting, right? You, I want you to verbally thank someone that has helped you in your life. And so, hey, that's a big piece, I think, to what we do as well. It, it, you know, trying to just to develop, you know, good young people and, and prepare for their professional work. But at the same time, hey, we want to win. Winning is what we're here for. It's an extremely competitive league. It's a, a great level. So check us out and give us a chance. I love it, Coach. I uh, 
it's been a great conversation. I think, uh, you know, put my son down for your class of 33. Uh, cause I want, you know, <clears throat> you, I think you're, you're definitely somebody I wouldn't mind my, uh, my son playing for. So I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, that. No, I appreciate the time and, and wish you the best of luck in, in building something there and, and hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. Well, get get the word out in Bradenton. There's a lot of good players in Florida. We'd love to have them. They got to they got they got to love the snow though. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> my, my kids are dying for me to take them to see snow again because it's been a while. So uh, so we'll, we'll see. We'll come on up. We'll right. come on a good time. <clears throat> Sounds like a plan. Appreciate it, Coach. Take right. care. Thanks for all your work, man. Keep it up. It's good Th stuff. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.